Hello and welcome to our today's CTO. My name is Corel Fotulescu. I'm Chief Platform Officer at Pentalog, meaning I'm in charge with the products and the technology strategy of the group. I'm very happy we can do this session today. Uh, we are fully aware of the dynamics and uh, that everyone is talking about crisis in Ukraine. The same for the uh, previous session. Uh, we are not going to talk about um, uh, those things except if um, there are things related to the real CTO um, um, problems, challenges like business continuities, teams in those areas and things like this. Um, and uh, yeah, very happy to do this uh, session again with you. And today, this is a special day in the year, 8th of March. Um, again, we are not going to um, um, elaborate a lot on the uh, meaning uh, of this day or the place of um, equality and uh, between women and um, men. However, we are here to celebrate, to celebrate there are women in tech. And uh, for this special occasion, we have uh, another great company, as I hope you've uh, been used to, uh, used to until now. Uh, we have here Roxana from Banishel. Roxana, please join us. Hello, nice to be here. Nice to have you here, Roxana. So if you have, um, uh, if you can say a few words about yourself and what makes Banishel great. Uh, sure. So I'll start with Banishel and introduce you of what we do. So Banishel is a platform that took the task to create, to simplify the development uh, uh, life cycle in the terms that developers should not be concerned about infrastructure and environments. They should not have any bottlenecks and should, they should just uh, concentrate on writing code and creating great products. And Banishel uh, simplifies their, their life which is, uh, which is hel helping the business itself. So that's about Banishel and about me. Uh, I, I am CTO and founder at Banishel since two, uh, uh, 2018. Um, I've started, I, I think I've crossed most of uh, the, in, in my journey started from developer, uh, then switched to sysadmin and then to uh, DevOps and <laughs> then to cloud architect. And then I ended up as a junior CTO and uh, may, maybe now I'm more of a <laughs> junior medium CTO. But if you compare me with other CTOs, you'll find that I'm pretty junior. <laughs> Well, uh, let's talk about that. So how, uh, because um, you remember we've done a series of CTO fundamentals together and we've run that and it was um, uh, wonder wonderful to see all these people connected and uh, having questions about the CTO role. So we are here about that. So CTO role and how is implemented at Banishel. So can you give us a definition from your opinion of the role of CTO? How does it look, the role of CTO? Um, I think the, the, the best definition that I've heard because really there is not there is no really a definition uh, of what a CTO does because it does depend on the size of the company, of what the company does. And it may either be a technical person or a non-technical, a more business oriented. But the best definition that I found that was good for me was Alin's definition, the CEO, which uh, he said that the CTO is responsible for everything technical in a company. And starting from scratch, I found this definition to be pretty flexible because in the start, it's just about execution. You do a lot of execution because you're a one man, two man, three man company. So you're writing the code yourself. And then it starts uh, be more being about creating a team, an engineering team and more about leadership. And it was not really about leadership in the first time, in the first place. And then it's about creating different uh, teams a uh, customer success team, an engineering team, and a QA team, and uh, a, a technical sales team. So it's an uh, ever-changing role, but it's always related to everything technical. So even if you have um, a, a structure when you have team leads and you have head of uh, customer success, VP, VP of engineering, you are still concerned with, you know, helping them for, to, to, to grow their team and, uh, and help them in, in any task that they have. So everything related to technical is a good definition. 
Okay, okay. Interesting. And it reminds me about the Zapier's definition. I remember that those are, uh, and in the City of Fundamentals, we had Bob in his journey and he was looking at these videos on YouTube and he found the Zapier video and uh, uh, saying that nobody knows what the role of a CTO means and especially in the startup. So you are in this particular uh, setup also. And um, I have lots of questions for you here. Um, the first one about, was about your definition of the CTO role. I will continue with them. Audience, please, please shoot your questions on the chat. Um, a, a part of these uh, questions come from the CTO fundamental structure so that we stress that vision and see how much it really stands in uh, real world and how people implement that uh, idealistic view of, of the CTO role. Um, and uh, part of questions come from our CTO internal community and the most important part of questions should come from you. So feel free. Uh, when you have questions, write them down. I will also try, try to extract from what Roxana says um, some uh, highlights on the chat um, so that you can come back to them uh, uh, later. So uh, we've talked a bit about Banishal, about the CTO role, and it's quite a, a broad definition that you gave us. Huh? So uh, uh, everything related to technology. Uh, security? Yeah, sure. One of the data? main data? data protection, yep. Uh, data privacy, okay. Uh, infrastructure, no. Uh, well, it does depend. I mean, at a certain point, it is your responsibility, but the responsibility and ownership, first, they are not the same thing. And it does not really mean that you do them, but you are the owner that must ensure that they are made. And that can be externalized, the services, hire somebody new or write some specs in that manner. Uh, you are the owner of them. You are responsible for them. You're, you're not necessarily the one that, you know, does the tasks. Okay. And from these responsibilities, because that's very... Uh, wide range, uh, everything related to tech. Yeah. What are the two things that you find the most suitable for you, that you enjoy the most, and the two things that you hate the most? Oh, <laughs> okay. So uh, let me see. So enjoying the more most, I, I, I love talking <laughs> the most. I really like being, one of the responsibility is being the face of the company, participating in webinars, meeting a lot of really cool people and, uh, you know, spreading the word of what Bunny Shell does. And that can be also uh, helping and, and, and that can be with, with the marketing team, but also with the pre-sales and sales team. You, you do talk uh, with, with a lot of of uh, customers and you get uh, you get you you talk with existing customers and you get their opinion and their their pain points and you use them to build the product so i think that with gathering information from all people that sh surround me is one of the things that i think i love most the second one is with the product. Of course, it's related with the product roadmap and actively participating in research and technology research. Um, I, I don't have as much time to do that, but it's a really a thing that I enjoy a lot because uh, I think um, I should read more things that are related to business, but I have to admit that I really, I really, I most of the books and most of the things that are, I read are documentation, which is not really a, necessarily a good thing. Um, what I uh, remember, read more. Huh? Read more. <laughs> Please, uh, continue. Um, and I think the least thing. Um, don't want to sound cheesy and say that I don't have one. Let me think of one. <laughs> Um, I think that the, the, the things that I didn't like were the things that I felt maybe powerless in doing them. So let me give you an example. Uh, being the team lead for the development team is something that is very demanding. It's incredibly demanding and you really have to be all in that. And that's why we, we now have a VP of engineering, which is so he is great at what what he does and he is doing a better job than I would have ever done. And I think that if you feel that there are things, of course, you will be doing some things that you might not like. But if you have some things that you don't like because you feel that you can't do them or you can't do them properly, that's, 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 a, that's a moment where you have to step back and see if you can solve that issue in a different manner. Okay. So... Everyone should remember there are things we enjoy, things that we enjoy less, but still need to be addressed. Uh, in this situation, uh, there is 
uh, a part of the less in efficient side uh, was delegated uh, to a yeah. more efficient uh, implementation. Um, good, good. Um, let me go to the next question about CTO being a translator. So we can't say it enough. Uh, the CTO plays an important role in translating business opportunities uh, for the technology team and technology opportunities for the um, uh, board and for the business. Yep. And this is actually the origin of the CTO as a, as a role that came from research for translating research to business. Um, so what can you tell about uh, the way you implemented the CTO role at Banishel and the translator role? So the translation role, I think it's still a big part of the responsibilities that I have. And it's not just about uh, business to technical and technical to business in a manner. I mean, not just explaining business a strategy and vision to the product team or engineering team, but also Mm, but 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 also translating technical needs uh, and I'll give you a good example uh, technical depth you sometimes have technical depth and you sometimes have to allocate some time to address those issues so that must also be translated in business uh, language when you have to say well we do have to take a sprint to to tackle those issues because if not there will be they will get worse and that's also uh, related to other departments all departments that uh, I, I, I am I'm currently working with most of them and translating uh, technical um, technical uh, strategies and technical concepts to the pre-sales team, technical sales team, to the customer success team. So you do need that kind of translation. Of course, you don't need to become a bottleneck in that. The, the thing, what you want to create is flows in which those translation happen naturally between departments and there is not really a need for a single person or a team of translator to do that. But you do have to, uh, it is maybe your responsibility to make sure that departments uh, talk uh, talk with 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 a common language be between each other and share information in a in a manner that they can understand. Especially okay. when you're talking about, for example, customer success team and product team, they really need to be uh, to 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 have a tight connection and understand things. Okay. Okay. So, uh, hope everyone. Uh... Uh, listen to that. Huh? Lots of time spent on uh, translator role. Uh, and a beautiful example there for technical concepts to presets. Uh, uh, that's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, let me go to the next question. And it seems uh, also a big responsibility. The partnership with the executive officer and the board in general. Huh? So um, it seemed important um, um, highly important uh, to spend time with the executive officer. So how much time do you spend uh, with uh, uh, your executive officer and what can you tell us that might be useful for the audience in terms of partnership, CTO, executive officer? Uh, so in my case, I think it was a mix between being a CTO and also being a co-founder uh, and sometimes I didn't know where one ended when the and when the other one started. But what can I wh what I can tell is that um, the CTO and the CEO in our company do talk a lot, <laughs> like kind of uh, uh, not really daily, because because uh, we don't have really daily things to talk about, but a lot. And I, I think that's important because I don't think you can do your job properly as a CTO if you are not aware of the the business strategy that that, that that is implementing at that certain mo moment which which can which can fairly change and you don't understand uh, correctly the vision the business vision which you are uh, implementing i think there there is a need for communication of course with the ceo and the uh, cto as for because uh, you also mentioned uh, communication with the investors i think uh, with, the, uh, with the board with the with, yeah uh, the board and the internal board but also also in the investors and in their eyes as well you are everything that is related to technical which means that you have to explain what is happening technical from a business perspective Let, let's dive in a bit so what kind of role do you play as a cto when it comes to uh, investment so how do you support the, the business pitch how do you help uh, what are the things that you do and you can share them with the audience here uh, mm -hmm. and might help them. 
I think the, 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 the greater part is explaining technical, uh, the, the te technicality of our, uh, the technical side of our product in a way that is inspiring for them. I mean, it's not that they will understand technical terms, but you have to uh, make the translation bet between what Kubernetes means, for example, for in the life cycle of a of a of a company for the life cycle uh, uh, development life cycle in a company and you have to explain it in such terms that are uh that uh that are inspiring and you always have to have that uh that that attitude uh, and and in order to do that you really have to be on board with what what is happening in in the in the business side of things so participating in, in in rounds for getting investment rounds and in, in meetings and helping translate the technical vision. And, and your company is a technical company, so that you're building a, um, a technical platform. So um, it seems in the core uh, value proposition of, um, so investors, are they technical? Do they understand what you're saying? Are they, um, uh, it requires lots of effort for you to, to do these pitches or? Uh, no, 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 not really. And I think that's a good thing because I don't think that really um, uh, business uh, strategy is that related to technical strategy. Business strategy is more about uh, what your product does and how it helps your customer in terms of, uh, and in our case, it's more about the value proposition that greatly influences their business, such as increasing velocity. It's not something technical that you need technical background to understand that increasing velocity will uh, benefit your business and cost optimization. So the value that we propose are not that uh, are not you, you don't require to have any technical background to understand them. They are basically business values. The way we implement them may have some say in uh, in business uh, in uh, in technical terms. And one thing that you might want maybe to to uh, you you might be you might need to do is. Uh, defined, for example, maybe you've had a lead and you couldn't, that, that, that it didn't become your customer and my, maybe you would have to explain why technically maybe your product was not ready for that and what happened, but in a way that they can understand, of course. Okay, okay. And um, uh, so we've touched a bit, uh, technology strategy, business strategy. You, you, you said something like, um, the, the value that we are providing and we are in increasing and we are building uh, it's not technical in the, in the eyes of, uh, of investors. Huh? Yeah. But how much of the technology strategy is business strategy and how much of the business strategy is technology strategy for Bunny Shell? So I think that technology strategy is like one layer below business strategy and that's, uh, that's because uh, we, we can all agree that technology is ever changing. It's changing daily. So the the, the vision, the business strategy, strategy should allow for technical strategy to uh, to be uh, to uh, integrate with new technologies that uh, that appear. So I think that's really important and to be adaptive. So if you're proposing that you are uh, making development life cycle easier. Uh, and uh, and faster, and it does not really matter how you are doing. Of course, if uh, you if uh, uh, most developers, most companies now tend to go on Kubernetes, okay, then you will do it on Kubernetes. But but if something new uh, arises, then you should shift to that technology. You should always shift to use newer technology or the technology that is trendy. And, uh, and so I, I hear you in a sense like uh, to keep the business strategy relevant, you always need to adapt your technology. Yeah. To follow that, uh, that business strategy relevant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. I, I write that. I, I try to write in the same time, but now I go to the next question. I write it afterwards so that the audience may uh, catch up if they onboard in, during the session. Uh, various moments and please 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 uh, write your questions early on the chat so that i can see them and it uh, uh, doesn't matter uh, uh, when they land i will just uh, uh, take them and uh, ask roxana um let's talk about um decisions from the top down sea level decisions so it seemed for us relevant that 
um, it's highly inefficient to take a lot of decisions. And usually um, at the highest level, we don't really look at the number of uh, decisions we uh, um, make and the cycle time of implementing those decisions. And we, there is an infusion of decisions uh, in the operations because we take lots of decisions at the uh, highest level. And uh, if we say, for example, um, in Kanban or Scrum, let's limit our work in progress, let's ensure we focus and not take all the stories in the sprint and things like this. Uh, it seemed um, reasonable to think that limiting the number of decisions the uh, the highest layers of every company uh, take uh, will bring value. Uh, so what's your take on it? Um, so I think it's more about the process of refining the process of taking decisions, even as, as a, uh, at a C level. I mean, if you have people that, that occupy uh, positions that are more... Um, you have more knowledge and and would help you take the decisions one thing that we do at banishel is that there are not not not, not that many decisions that are taken at the c level that are not really uh that are none of them are not debatable i mean we do debate them a lot with with all the managers and everyone has a say in it and it's more about i don't think it's maybe not about limiting the number of decisions but uh, bringing more proof to the table that's that that's a that's that, that's a, always a, a good point to start it and it doesn't really matter what the decision is about and you you will not get sometimes you will not get uh everyone to agree with that and that's okay that, uh, that there's no problem in that either but as long as the decision that to take are well uh, well based and documented and have proof and uh are have sense then um then there shouldn't be any problems with implementing them. It's just a, a part of how, how, how C-level people help the other managers implement the ideas. Because it is also the responsibility not only to take decisions, but make sure that those decisions are executed in a certain degree. So I'm, I'm, I'm leaving a bit the, the time I have here with the uh, questions. Um, you've touched something that uh, rings a bell and say, uh, in, in modern leadership, we say, um, leaders are there to ensure impediments are removed uh, um, in the way of those who are doing the progress. So those who are incrementing, those who work, those who... Um, so um, how much of your role is, in fact, supporting the teams and uh, facilitating their work so that they go faster and better? And um, how much... Uh, of this kind of help you get from other roles in the company. So I Facilitating think, the work and removing impediments for the operational teams to deliver. Well, I think it's a good, I mean, of course, it is part of the responsibility, but um, the thing that we found is that it can also be, if you have a single facilitator that does that, it can be also a bottleneck. So it's pretty more important than being able to facilitate uh, the, 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 the communication and removing obstacles and so on and so forth, it's much more important that the teams communicate with each other. I mean, without needing the, the facilitator, because you will end with a bottleneck at one time if you do that. So should is your executive officer also a facilitator? Are there any other facilitators in, the, in your company? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can see uh, him, him working as a facilitator. I mean, yeah, he's, um, well, part of his role is to facilitate with, with every department, right? We, we all, all talk with him and uh, uh, try to, 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 to take better decisions. And uh, do you have a, a, a role focused doing just this, uh, removing impediments like a Scrum Master? Uh, that's usually a job or the, um, uh, or uh, uh, it's through, uh, your role in, uh, and every manager's role in the company? 
I think it's every every manager's role in the company. So, for example, if uh, let's let's just let's have an example. I mean, if there is an issue that is happening, maybe as customer support, maybe they have a thing that uh, creates more work for them and would be uh, better if something was implemented or something was fixed and the the team would work less in that manner. You don't really need a facilitator to go talk to the engineering or product team. They can talk. I mean, if they can solve it by themselves, of course, you, you can have a facilitator. And that doesn't really require it to be the CTO, of course. Um, but um, usually things like that do happen if, if, if there is good communication between departments. Okay, okay. Um, so we are in the section of 360 degree technology knowledge, uh, so less CTO specific, but um, IT general knowledge. Huh? And um, I was thinking about questions like um, um, accessibility. Um, are there something that um, you focus on um, uh, you, are there any debates around it, how to do it better, how, how uh, to make it work for uh, a variety of audiences? How much uh, accessibility um, are you talking about at Banishal? Uh, I think that uh, that really accessibility is one of the, uh, the uh, one of the great points that we have in the Banishal vision. I mean, our product is meant to be used uh, for for you know freelancer developers to startups with a smaller team and medium teams and bigger teams, and that and I think that's great. And uh, one thing that I really like about this is that. Um, Somebody told me that you will not be able to work with all your heart on something that you don't believe it is really a game changer. And I think it's totally true. And I think in that sense, Banishal is a game changer because it does empower development teams all, all uh, across a variety of different company sizes and they build better products that you will be and you will be their client <laughs> one day. So uh, I, I, and I do see this shift in accessibility in products, making things that before were more, uh, were hard to do, making them easier for even the smaller teams. And I think it is a trend today with that. Okay, okay. Um... And um, also you include in accessibility things related with, uh, for uh, people with uh, um, um, uh, less happier, in, less developed, like with a small handicap or things like this. Is there something related in your, in your development strategy linked to this? Uh, well, no, not sure if, in, if in, in those terms, not sure if in those terms, I, uh, I cannot okay. see why but um it's a very uh, broad and new topic very hard to get into the the strategies uh, uh, i'm personally struggling with it so it's lots of uh, um, uh, things to uh, and i was wondering if that's a a, a, a question you are um, uh, debating on at, at financial now let's look at a question from the audience uh Cosmin. how do you study the competition can you say something uh, which is useful for the audience and um... well in order to study it i mean of course um you one of the responsibilities are that uh, to to make some uh, market research but it's not uh, one thing that I, I really want to say about, you know, studying competitors and that is that you you should also not be very inf i mean not influenced and in doing some things just because you saw that the competition does. So there, there is a very, uh, uh, um, you, do, you don't, uh, you have to, to see it objectively. And sometimes the, something that I, I saw is that sometimes some products that you, you think that that there are competitors, you, you can work together with them. And of course, you can, uh, for, for studying, you can try their products and uh, also talk to them, of course. We've talked with some of our competitors and that's good and maintain a good relationship. Yeah, so um, I've, I've even uh, witnessed the relationship between uh, you and one of your competitors. I, I think that's interesting to, to be in touch with competitors. Um, 
So, Cosmin, I, I hope this uh, answer helps you. And uh, uh, if uh, please go with the new questions uh, if you want to know more. Um, so, um, DevSecOps. Now, if there is something which is in the core of what you do, uh, so, but what can you say about the trend of DevSecOps? Uh, we are shifting everything left. Right. Mm -hmm. So lots of uh, 20 years ago, we were talking about putting QAs in teams so that the quality assurance is part of the um, intrinsic value of, uh, of the delivery. And then we say, let's put infrastructure in the development and then put security in the development. So what's your take on it? What, where do you think we're heading and uh, what is the state in your opinion of the industry in these regards? So I think that, that security is more and more of a concern in all the teams. And I think that's a perfect shift. I mean, the only way to scale a team with regards to security is put it as a thing that they should, they they need to have in mind with everything they're doing. And that's good. I mean, it's the only way to scale product. All the product must be, all the specifications must be made with security in concern and with the engineering team, with the QA team, they, they uh, if you can manage all the team to have a filter and everything they're doing to ask themselves is, is what I'm doing exposing any data is it safe what I'm doing is am I using I don't know some deprecated code so uh, having security and I think the, the trend is is about this one I, I it's about making security not not just having a separate department that is concerned with it, but making it a thing that is in the mind of, of everyone in the engineering team, and maybe not only in the engineering team. So having security in mind for everyone, yep. um, can you share us the best practices? Of how, how do you share the knowledge there? How, how, does, it, how does knowledge spread in, the, in your team? So uh, the, the, it, it's, uh, in a way, it's per department. Every department has his internal documentation and internal tr trainings and internal um, uh, sessions that they have to spread the, the, the spread the knowledge. And if there was something, uh, a vulnerability that, that uh, has been found, we do have, we, we share it and uh, we learn from it. And there is also training, of course, with security in terms of um, following some courses, going to some conferences, participating in, uh, in some webinars, and then sharing with the other team what, what you've learned. So the, I think it's more of a culture and not more of a framework to do that. Yeah, yeah. So that rings a bell a lot for the, the DevSecOps uh, uh, as a culture. So I, I will write this. Uh, and then uh, I have a question for you from Elena. Um, what informs your decisions when choosing a programming language and design framework for a product? Uh, so for the programming language, it's not, um, it's not a decision that the CTO takes really. It's not really a, it's not a decision that the VP of engineering uh, takes. It's more about the developers. So they kind of take this decision because you do have to choose um, a language that they are used to. You cannot really choose something that is like if you choose Ruby on Rails, but there is nobody that knows Ruby on Rails in your team, you're not really making a good, good decision. So some things that are the, the, uh, in that sense are kind of made by developers, that there are decisions that are made by them as well. <laughs> So, and it's good to listen in that sense, because if you're, uh, you, you will not be able to make all the decisions all, all by yourself. So you, you look at the developers' uh, mind share, in a sense, how, how popular is that and how many developers are there? Huh? Yeah. That's a, a very interesting uh, 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 takeaway, I believe. Hmm? I also have lots of questions about uh, um, uh, developers uh, a bit later. So if Elena, you have uh, your answer uh, or you want to have another question related to this, uh, please write it. Um, um, no? Okay. So I will continue, I will continue with um, uh, leadership. And um, if you can share with us, um, so you've talked about the CTO 
as a role and of course leader Banishel uh, that you um, also like to be the face of the company so that says a bit about being the, the leader uh, through the out, out, uh, uh, outer world facing uh, a bit of, of your executive officer but what can you say in, in, in a few words that can define the leadership style of Banishal management? A leadership style of uh, Banishal management. Um, so I think that I, I see that is most common in every leader that we have is the part of uh, ability to inspire. And that starts from, uh, from the CEO and and I think that it is, uh, I think that this may be the most, most powerful trait that there is because in a startup you will have to, um, there, is, there will be a lot of work to do and you really need to be, uh, you know, enthusiastic of what you're doing. And uh, of course, if you want the company to succeed, all departments must move in the same direction and it must be a trait that can be passed from the CEO to the management to, uh, to everyone that participates. So I think that the, the ability to inspire and we'll, we, we, uh, funny thing is that every two weeks we have a, uh, you know, a, a culture meeting that we do online. So we can do it with everyone. And uh, Aline, uh, the CEO, is kind of begged to, to do a speech <laughs> to inspire us and, and say who else, uh, who, who, uh, what are the people that he has met. He's currently in US right now. And he, uh, everybody, we can't wait to hear what, what he's doing and wh who he, he spoke with and what's the strategy now. And, um, and it's a, a nice thing to have because uh, being able to be inspired. But of course, there are also other things that are really important, such as you know empathy and uh, strategic thinking. Of course, they are all. But I I will keep that with the the. the so ability. it seems a, a very human centric uh, kind of leadership, huh? It, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, so um, I have a question for you. I hope uh, it's a an answerable one in this session. Is your executive officer also coming from the technology background? Yeah. This seems very technical as a, a, a company itself. So, so you said yes, huh? Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. How, um, um, how do you ensure uh, he's not taking too much of your responsibility and you are not on too much on his plate? How, how, how does it work? I'm not sure uh, the problem would be that I would be too much on his plate. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, as for, I think it comes down to uh, delegation and a uh, trust. So if you if you put someone to take decisions for the technical uh, technical part, you uh, even though you are a technical person, you have to have this trust that the person can uh, can take those decisions. And uh, I, I'll tell you one thing that is kind of relevant here, and it's a really nice uh, thing to know uh, when you when you're talking to investors. One thing uh, we, we got some feedback. And one thing that they told us is when they see the interaction between the CEO and the CTO, they also see, they also watch uh, on how many things they, they talk on each other. So if the CTO is, some, is saying something and there comes the CEO with something that he needs, uh, he feels that uh, he needs to say something more, that that can be a, a, a thing like the CEO does not really trust that the CTO knows what he's, he's saying. So it's, mm. a, it's a nice point, to, <laughs> a nice thing to know. So I think at the end of the day, it's trust. Even, and also from the CTO perspective, if it's good that you uh, consult yourself. I mean, there, it's perfectly okay, even though even if the CTO is technical, CEO, you, you really have to, uh, take, um, uh, to take that as an advantage and consult with him. So before going to the um, questions related to the size of the team and the... Uh, uh, so that we get uh, more into the um, uh, people aspects of your uh, job and leadership. You said something about a meeting every two weeks, a cultural meeting. Yeah. It, um, at, at least for the as a statement, that doesn't sound very common. Um, um, 
please share for, for me and the audience um, uh, what's that about? Um, I understood that uh, the executive officer shares um, inspiring uh, dynamics, what happens, what he's doing, how he's talking with investors and uh, partners. Right? This is what I understood and customers. But um, um, is there anything else that we've missed from the, can, what can you tell us? So in, in, the, in a culture meeting, every manager has to, you know, they, they, there is a presentation and we prepare some uh, points that we are working on. And that is uh, so that everyone in the company knows what we're doing right now and not in a way uh, of uh, keeping track, but in a way of uh, feeling that you participate. I mean, every, ev everyone in the customer success team and in the sales team must know what the product is doing at or, or what what new news we have, who has joined as uh, uh, who, what new colleagues and welcoming new colleagues we have. Uh, uh, and um, if we do, we would uh, take a survey uh, with your colleagues, huh? all of them, all of them, no exception, and we would ask them how uh, how much they contribute and they feel their contribution matters in the product life cycle. On a scale from one to five, what do you think they'd answer? Uh, <laughs> I think some of would complain that they don't contribute enough. <laughs> And uh, I mean, I think that would be the case. And I think that kind of uh, two, three on a scale from one to five two, would three. be the correct okay. answer. But okay. there will be some people that will say one. <laughs> <laughs> There's no perfect answer. And leadership is not like a, a recipe we, we could do everything. So we are getting better and better to it. And that, uh, there are some decisions that we, uh, that that's, uh, there are some decisions that, are more um, that maybe may seem technical, but have to be taken from more of a business perspective, even if those decisions uh, bring technical depth or bring compromises. So such decisions are, I mean, you cannot really escape them. And if they make somebody to feel like uh, it shouldn't have been taken, you just have to explain why. <laughs> why that is like such because at the end of the day we are all striving for the same purpose and that's to become a unicorn okay okay so uh, one takeaway that i think it's worth sharing it here um remember this is a journey uh, there's no perfect situation implementation that, that might be an idealistic view we've developed one uh, there are others, so we are getting better at this, and uh, uh, this is important. And being humble and uh, admitting uh, where you are, strong points and things to be improved, it's also important. Huh? So if not, we wouldn't have CTO talks. Huh? Um, <laughs> so let's go to the human resources side of, of the job. Let's go to things like um, uh, a few uh, a, a bit of description about the... Uh, your teams. So how large is your team and how big is the uh, Banisher team uh, in general? So oh, all the people. I don't know the number because it's ever growing. <laughs> I don't That's know. Good. I That's think good. the number increased from last week, I think with three or four new colleagues. So I really cannot say it. So how, how, how would you? It's 30 or so. I mean. So, so that... more than 30? More yeah, than 30. more than 30. Yeah. Yeah, so, something like that. I mean, I think that my colleagues will, will type on Slack right now. <laughs> and in, in terms of technologies, uh, some keywords that uh, just to give them some context around the... Uh, 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 what technologies we are using? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, uh, because we're implementing uh, DevOps, I think most of them, but of course it's, it's, it's cloud, it's Kubernetes, it's... Um, we are um, a lot of clients have e-commerces or uh, using we're doing everything kind of in the devops landscape so it's about log aggregation and monitoring and uh, ensuring security and data compliance and building ci cd tools so there are a lot of yeah buzzwords. yeah but i i will rephrase because i i wasn't precise enough so uh, your uh, developers uh, are they php developers or python developers or dotnet developers or java developers just to okay Proud. So, so uh, I think uh, PHP and Node would be the, the, the top two in terms of programming languages. 
Uh, okay, yeah. good. I've and um, is, it is it hard to source those skills in the market? Um, I don't think it's hard. It's hard. Uh, I mean, in um, it's not about the programming language. It's about the um, the surrounding knowledge because if we are we are building a developer tool, so in that sense, uh, the people that we hire, for example, our backend developers are not people that just know how to program in PHP or Node. Uh, it's about having the general knowledge of everything of mostly everything that is surrounding DevOps and cloud and um, and CICD's pipelines. So uh, in that term, it's not really that easy to find people that are uh, that experienced. And I think it also requires a lot of years of experience. You also said you have a VP of engineering. Yeah. Huh? How many people do report to you directly? Uh, so direct. So uh, directly, it's about... Uh, Mm, well, about the reporting directly, they, uh, for example, developers do report directly to the VP of engineering, of, call, of course, but there are also calls that they have with me as a CTO, but also with Alina as a CEO. Okay. My, 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 Can we say it safe that it's only your, you have only VP of engineering who is, in a sense, hierarchical speaking, reporting directly to you? Uh, the VP of engineering is reporting directly to the CEO. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it, it's context. So, so for that, everyone should. Uh, and um, uh, this VP of engineering is focused mostly on uh, recruitment, onboarding, uh, uh, technical yeah. skills, uh, like uh, not coding, not pair programming. Uh, so he's the scrum master. So he also creates the, the, the sprints and um, it, does the refinement uh, sessions and um, mm, takes care that all the tasks are well specified from the product and from the research and also works closely with the product um, for specific if technical specification as such, but also is part of the recruiting for the development team. So he is all in one marvelous person. Oh, that's great feedback. So <laughs> I'll I'll search for him uh, and uh, share this video, this recording. By the way, this is recorded, and uh, you can share it. Uh, um, and we encourage you to do so. Let's spread the word about wonderful things everyone is doing. Um, okay. So um, if we would do a survey, okay, uh, with the people you've interact interacted in the last twelve months. Uh, what would be the skill they appreciate the more, the most for you, and the skill they would say you really need to work on it? <laughs> and I'm laughing because it's the same skill. I mean, um, <laughs> some people say that I am. Uh, some people like that I am too. That I am very enthusiastic. I mean, it, it also depends on what department we're talking. Some departments like that I'm very enthusiastic and because enthusiasm is very good when you're talking to clients, when you're talking to potential leads, when you're creating, when you're doing webinars and it's a nice thing to have. But then again, <laughs> when, when talking with the engineering and the product team and too, too much enthusiasm, <laughs> can create discomfort because uh, may, maybe you, you uh, lead to uh, underestimated effort. Yeah, so it's the same thing that they like and they hate. <laughs> and what can you tell us about um, skills assessment uh, and filtering? Like, uh, of course, it's in our best interest to um, give more chances to the teams we work with. Uh, to help them uh, uh, ensure they are having uh, enough skilled teams um, and all the skills they require. So what can you tell us about um, assessments during recruitment? Are there any specific tools or practice that you would encourage others to do? Um, so the, the 
the recruiting is done in three steps in our process. So let's talk about the technical recruiting. So the, of course, Solin from uh, the, the VP of Engineering is doing uh, the, I am helping him recruit, but the way we do it is first he has a talk with them and he he uh, he sees if he, if they have the three values that we share globally in the in, in the in the company and those refer to uh, honesty reliability and happy and not happy because you have to be always happy happy in the terms that you have to be happy with what you're doing <laughs> i always have to explain that one <laughs> and first there are uh, th these things that uh, that are really really more important to us than the technical knowledge itself and there comes the the and there are some basic skills that uh, the person needs to have and we sometimes use some tests that are online to assess to you know, to to assess the the um, uh, the, the person because uh, and after that if he passes the test and the test for the technical team is kind of a generalistic uh, know-how on all on everything that surrounds devops so he must know of course programming but also know uh containerization docker and kubernetes and worked with them or know why why they exist and uh all but also with uh with pipelines and tools for um that that are part of the developer life cycle and then we have the interview and for the interview there are certain questions that we we put but my favorite part of the interview is i take a problem that we have you know, internally in the company. And I asked that person for his opinion on that. And I'm doing, you know, two, two things in the same time. Because if you are hiring someone to help you, uh, and for my part, uh, I, uh, maybe I need some help with some knowledge sharing and some research on a certain in a certain technology. If you are hiring someone to help you, you might as well just uh, ask him there to see if, he can really help you or not, and it's um and I love questions that are more story like and how would you do it if you would do it and without correct or wrong answers and you kind of see uh, the level of detail which that person goes to tells you how much experience he has. Okay, uh, I, I really. Uh think this could be helpful, so I wrote it there to take a real problem from your company. Um, your company faces and ask your candidates how they solve it. Uh, yeah. uh, maybe something interesting interesting uh, goes out of, of that uh, interview and you also assess their ability to address their problem, this problem. Uh, very, very interesting. And um, do you remember the hardest um, challenge you had as a CTO? Can you, can you share that with us? Uh, yeah. So I think um, as a CTO, you have lots of responsibilities which translate in lots of tasks. And depending on the teams that you are uh, working with and that you are talking to, all the tax, tasks seem uh, uh, very important and should have been done yesterday. So, and you uh, are drowned in a lot of work. And um, if you don't have the ability to take some steps back, and just look at the, the issues at hand and prioritize them, then it's, it will be awful. So, and uh, so that I think- was, That was very hard for you? It was incredibly, incredibly hard. So sometimes it's still hard because <laughs> the, 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 the thing is that there, there is also things, there is always things to do. But if you don't take a step back and you are concentrated all, only on resolving the problems at hand, uh, you might not even have the, the the success that you envisioned you would have when you completed them, and the answer can 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 be uh, on uh, prioritization, on delegating some of the tasks. Uh, there are multiple solutions, or that, or not doing that in the first place, or changing the way that you 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 saw the issue, or just hiring someone. Um, but yeah, I think that this is one of the things that. Uh, that were and sometimes are uh, most hard for me. So we'll take another question from the audience um, and we will have time for just another one. So ma maximum two questions. And then we will let uh, Roxana uh, end up with a, um, a thought 
uh, that she would like to share with the audience, think that something that she thinks matters for you. So whoever wants to have another question, so I will take the uh, Vin's questions. Sorry for spelling that completely wrong, I believe. Um, sorry for this. Um, so I'll take that question from uh, Vin. About resource management utilization, do you have any mechanism to know if, let's say, 30 people is actually the number you need, not 50, 60, or just 20 people? can almost cover everything already. Uh, so I think this is responsibility that has shifted to the managers of different departments and they are the ones responsible of not over hiring or not under hiring people. And I think they're using right now different uh, different way, of course, depending on the department, they are using different ways to, uh, to measure that. I mean, for, for customer success, it's very simple to measure that. But even for engineering, if you hire someone and the velocity has not gained, uh, has not increased, you ask yourself why, and then you, uh, you get to a certain point. But you will not be, I mean, I don't think I would be, I would be able to, to keep track on that. So I think that's a good idea for something like, to delegate a thing like this. Always keep it in mind and talk from time to time about it, but delegate it to the managers. So you, you're not biased about what So in, in a sense, what you're saying is that you can't really tell, but you delegate this and the responsibility of managers of departments is to not over hire or under hire, right? Yeah, and to measure, of course, and to measure uh, and uh, measure the efficiency of their the team because those numbers are uh, should be calculated. Uh, I hope in, uh, this is a satisfying answer for you. So the, the key here seems to be trust that uh, Roxana uh, mentioned. Um, and uh, I hope it answers to you. Huh? Uh, yeah, so we have... Uh, uh, four minutes to go. Roxana, please tell us something that you'd like, uh, a key takeaway you'd like the audience to live with um, from this session. I, I think I've, I've shown more of my human side <laughs> than my technical side, so I have, hope I'm not really that cheesy. <laughs> Uh, well, first, I want to thank you, uh, everyone, for participating, and I really hope that some things that I've said said would uh, will help you in a journey or just understand better the, the role of, of a CTO. Uh, and one thing that I really want to say, because uh, I think I would have loved to know it, uh, like two years ago, maybe three years ago, is that uh, as a CTO in a company, in a startup, it's normal to have, uh, it's normal at some times to become bottle, a, a bottleneck and it's, it's normal to feel that nothing you're doing is, is good. And if you're feeling, if you're feeling always responsible and you're feeling always bad for everything that happens related to technology, you're on the good track, but you need to take a, a step behind. You need to talk with the CEO. That's really important and check how those, uh, uh, check, check how you can uh, fix those things. But uh, kind of never quit in this because it's a really a wonderful journey. Okay, so um, if you feel you are a bottleneck, you are on the right track. Huh? So uh, uh, share that with uh, your partners, executive officer, and uh, um, find a solution for it. Roxana, thank you. And um, everyone here, thank you for your aud audience. And uh, hopefully we will see you at the next CTO talk. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Great Women's Day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.